This idea is actually quite simple. We got some economic interest. Because they're chopping down the rainforest to grow Billions soy. Billions of animals slaughter. One big large corporation. Marks the beginning of an organized movement to bring about this change. Hi, I'm Nelson Campbell. Welcome to another episode of Open Tribe News, where we tell inspiring stories of people and organizations making change through our social action platform at opentribe.com. Today, we're going to introduce a story taking place in Chicago in neighborhoods on its west and south sides. These are underserved neighborhoods where educational and economic opportunities are limited and where even healthy food can be hard to come by. The term underserved is an accurate adjective for these neighborhoods. Let me explain. The problems in these communities are products of history. As we've been reminded by the recent protests, the deck has been stacked against communities of color in America since its inception. It's time to acknowledge this history and finally commit society's resources to righting these wrongs. To me, the term underserved describes what we as a society have too often done in the past, which is to turn a blind eye to the suffering of many of our black and brown communities. A free society can endure only when all of us are free. A selfish freedom is not freedom, it's just selfishness. Today, we're going to learn about a local hero in Chicago who's helping to bring healthy food into neighborhoods in dire need of healthy food. Dr. Terry Mason is a plant-based nutrition advocate who many people know from his appearance in the pioneering film, Forks Over Knives. Dr. Mason is a physician who transitioned into hospital administration, helping to manage one of our nation's largest health systems. He's also worked tirelessly through his church and elsewhere to improve the lives of his neighbors in Chicago. I've known Terry for quite a few years now and consider him a close friend and I'm happy to have him here with me today. Welcome, Terry. Thank you so much, Nelson. I really appreciate the opportunity. So, Terry, you're going to uh, most likely be a recurring guest here on the show. Um, so I think let's get started by introducing you to our viewers. Um, tell us a little bit about your background, uh, where you came from, and just kind of outline the life story of Terry Mason. Well, I'm one of 10 kids, uh, the fifth one, as a matter of fact, and grew up in Inglewood, which is now has a bad reputation. It was a great neighborhood when I grew up in it back in the 50s and 60s. Um, I went on to high school, to a vocational high school, and went on to Loyola undergrad, and then the med school U of I, and did a residency in urology, and practiced as a board-certified urologist in the city of Chicago for 26 years. It was there while treating men with erectile dysfunction that because of the work that Mr. Dr. Campbell had done with his book called The China Study and the Caldwell Esselstyn had written in his book on how to prevent and reverse heart disease that I began to make the connection between the foods we were eating and the diseases I was seeing, notably erectile dysfunction. I did that for some time. Uh, treating men with all kinds of things, including injections, drugs, and even surgeries to put in artificial devices within the penis to create an erection. But at one point, I had to ask myself, what the hell am I doing? If I got to know, and when we got these movies and started working with Brian Wendell on Forks Over Knives, and I got a chance to meet the folks that I just met, some of the folks I just mentioned, it was clear to me that Perhaps God had a different trajectory for me. Terry, I know you're doing some really critical work in Chicago right now, and I want to talk to you about that today. But before we get to that, um, could you paint for us a, a picture of life 
in, in the communities that you're working in right now, which I believe is the uh, west and south sides of Chicago? Just so we yeah, can kind of get a what, visual of, of what life is like there. Sure. There was a study, and it was done by the Public Health Association a long time ago, where we looked at zip codes. And we know now that your zip code is more important than your genetic code for how long you live. And in Chicago, you can get on our public transportation and ride 15 minutes on the train and go from a community that has a life expectancy of nearly 90 years old to a community that has a life expectancy of only 60. A 30-year gap and a 15-minute ride. So I, I try to work in, in those communities. And we've actually at the American Public Health Association, we're going to represent again to this year uh, a, a paper that we're, we're working on that talks about the role that food plays. And let me just give you, Mari Gallagher did a study oh, back in probably 2010 or so that looked at these areas that they called food deserts. In fact, that was how that term got coined. And in these food deserts, what she looked at was the relative distance people had to travel to get good foods versus the distance they could travel to get the regular fast foods, fried, uh, the mass prepared, drive throughs and so on and so forth by all the brands that we're familiar with. And what she found was she did a calculation on years of potential life lost. And those areas where the opportunity to buy good foods were usually far away and the opportunity to buy bad foods were close by, she calculated that those areas where the bad foods were close and convenient they had several years of potential life lost. So what we tried to do or what we're doing is we're working to try and close that gap. Uh, but one of the things, Nelson, that you're hearing at first here that we're discovering is that when people have not had access and eaten, had an opportunity to eat good foods and to have those tastes actually become part of who they are, then what happens is even when many times when they get the opportunity because they don't have the taste, they won't seek it out. So it's not just putting the food in the neighborhoods as much as it is reintroducing to their palates these foods. And once they do that, they're like, oh, wow, this, is, this tastes pretty good. Yeah, and so we've, got, yeah, we've got communities in Chicago where we had teenage boys, there's a lady who named uh, Sheila Muhammad that took a, a Chicago Transit Authority bus, an old bus, converted it to a vegetable van and went through the communities. And there were young teenage boys and girls who had never tasted an apple, hmm. never in their entire life, never saw it, didn't know what it was. So those are the communities that we're looking at. You told me something else, Terry, that was quite moving in a prior discussion that we had um, that I, I, I want you to speak to just a, for a short while here. Um, how were those neighborhoods and this, the west and south sides of Chicago impacted um, by the recent protests? Well, in some, in some of the communities <clears throat> where we had demonstrations of unrest, uh, by and large, most of those things were okay, but there were some communities where there was damage that was done. And it was damage that was done to some of the stores, the very stores that the folks needed in order to get the foods that we're talking about. And I can tell you what was really very, very uh, heartening to see was that the community came out and actually helped. They actually helped sweep up the glass and get rid of the stuff and to uh, encourage the the owners of these stores to reopen, particularly the drug stores and the food uh, food stores. And I was really, really touched when when we saw these groups of folks going over to do whatever they could do to help get the stores open because they weren't the ones that did this destruction. So people did get together and they did 
try to make sure that they looked out, particularly for the seniors. Uh, there were people that were started to just go and, and take seniors once the, the stores opened again. That I mean, it was just really, really, really nice because people were really upset about what was going on, particularly with the seniors and their access to food. So I'm happy that uh, we saw this sort of outpouring from our communities. Otherwise, they get a bad name. Well, the thing that was um, kind of moving to me is that, you know, that had happened and some of these areas lost, uh, at least temporarily lost uh, some, some of their supply of food. And, and you kicked in right away, I guess, along with a lot of other community members to help uh, bring food into those areas. And um, you, you mentioned that to me before, but it, it really speaks to who you are. Uh, you know, that's, that's what you've done all your life is, is that sort of thing. Yeah, I think that Nelson, and, and I just wanted to mention while we, when you talked about uh, Plant Pure Nation, uh, we, when, when you wanted to do that, we, we opened, uh, Pastor Moss opened up our church. And we had, what, over 2,000 people that showed up to watch that movie, which, which shows to this point, that, to this other point that you're making, that there are people who care. And there are people who want to know, but they don't necessarily know how. Yeah, so this is a, actually, this is a really key point you're making, Terry. And I want to circle back to this, this very point here in just a second. Um, I, I do remember with great fondness when I came to your church, uh, that still holds the record, I think, as the biggest crowd I've ever talked to. <laughs> so we had, we had a huge turnout, and it was just a beautiful day. Uh, and, and I'll never forget that. Um, but let's circle back to this point. But before we do that, um, I want to ask you a little more about specifically what it is that you're doing there. I, I know there's a farm involved and, you know, you've mentioned some of this to me before, but, but just outline uh, your, your current work there in Chicago. Yeah, what we're working with is a church called the Vernon Park Church of God. Uh, they were able to secure about a new place to build a church uh, so that was 76 acres of land. And their pastor, Reverend Gerald January, was a man of vision. And his plan was to use that land to serve the community. And though he had, not just in terms of providing a space for worship, but there was a farm called Mother Carr's Farm was a member of the church. And when I got wind of this with uh, the, the, the guy that's really running that operation, Mr. Anthony Williamson, that we could expand uh, that tremendously. And Anthony Williamson started out with a CSA, a community-sponsored agriculture project, but we really began to grow that. And, and I saw it as an opportunity to bring really, really high-quality fruits and vegetables to our communities. So the way the program works now, uh, for we, we sell what's called two shares. We sell a full share and we sell a half share. And the full share is about 450 and the half share is about half that. And basically what it entitles you to do is you can get enough food for, for the full share for about a family of almost people, about 12 people. You said a full share uh, is enough for 12 people? Yep, 8 wow. to 12 people. So, and that's $450 for a full share? For the whole season. Wow. That's, that's not uh, one time. That's for the whole yeah. growing season. Yeah. So, every, so what happens, let me tell you how fresh this food is, Aunt, uh, Nelson. The food is picked on Friday, straight out the garden, out the farm, and you pick it up on Saturday. So, so that's really interesting. So, that, so you have a, a kind of a business model figured out where that income is sufficient to support the cost of, of producing that food. And so, you know, as demand grows, you can scale that? Yes, that's our plan. And uh, our goal is to eventually take all the land that the pastor has and then buy the adjacent farm land to continue and expand the operation. And I should also say that what we've also done is we bought what are called returning citizens. These are people who are released from the penal institutions. 
We're bringing those men and women out, mostly men right now, to help with the work, and we are able to pay them. And we also have students that go to, uh, these are students that have had a little bit of a problem, and they go to one of the uh, selective schools for people who need a little extra help. And there we have them out on the farm trying to teach them where food comes from because people don't know. I mean, people think, especially the young people who don't know, especially from these communities, they think food comes from the store. They don't know it comes, there's a relationship to the earth and the water and the soil. And they're learning that. And so we're going to be recording them and letting them tell their own stories, what it's meant for them to be involved. So it's really, I mean, it's such a holistic way of trying to get people to understand the power of plants. When you see them grow from seedlings to these big towering plants, and then to see them appropriately prepared, and then you eat them, I mean, you can't get better than that, Nelson. Just yeah. can't get better than that. Yeah, this is really such an inspiring story, uh, Terry, and, and we're going to continue to follow this, as I mentioned to you before, um, because I think there's a lot of folks out there who are going to find this interesting and who may want to try to replicate what you're doing there. And it, it kind of leads me to, uh, back to something that you said a short while ago. You were talking about how the community came out to fix a problem. And, <clears throat> you know, as I sit and I listen to you, talk about this project that you're working on. It reminds me of a, uh, an interview that I heard a few years ago, and I've, I've searched hard to find the video footage of this, and I can't, <clears throat> but it was an interview of an executive of the Chicago White Sox, and he had grown up in Chicago. It might have been in one of these, uh, uh, maybe the South Side or the West Side, one, one of these areas. And it was during the summer when there was uh, a high level of violence. I don't remember what year that was, but it was in the news a lot. And so they interviewed him and they were talking about the community and you know what could be done to, to address this. And um, he, he's an African-American gentleman you know, from that community. And he started talking, he got quite emotional. He started talking about a mentoring program that had been started, that had achieved incredible success. And I, I don't remember all the details around it, but people from the community were the mentors and they, ca they came out and they worked with young, young people and, and had a tremendous impact. And then he talked about a school. Uh, I think it might've been a charter school uh, that had, again, had achieved tremendous success. But then he got quite emotional and he said, he said, you know, we have ideas. Um, you know, we, we, have a, we have a sense of what we need to do, and we're doing things. But he said, but, but first of all, there, there aren't the resources available to sustain those efforts. And second of all, when we do something like this, no one hears about it. No one knows about it. And, uh, and so he was, you know, he was quite upset about that. And, and I, I think that it goes to a, a fundamental point that oftentimes is overlooked, which is that you know, uh, in these communities where there are, uh, you know, more economic constraints and educational constraints and other issues, you know, uh, health issues, th those communities are full of people, full of people who have great talent and great passion and a sense of what has to be done to address those issues. Is, is, and that's kind of what you were saying before, I think. Yeah, I think, you know, People that live in these communities that they're not necessarily there by choice, they're there by circumstance. And we have to look at in Chicago what COVID really did, what COVID really did, and what I've talked about many times was expose uh, when we talked about communities of color, where all over the country communities of colors are more vast, adversely affected by COVID than anyone else in addition to those with these underlying comorbid positions, uh, physician um, situations or conditions. Um, there are the policies that created these communities is what's the crime. And the policies that created these structures that created 
this sort of poverty where I grew up is where, you know, you hear a lot of this shooting and stuff take place. But when I grew up there, none of that happened. We didn't have, I mean, the same house, same streets, same everything. But the difference, Nelson, the difference was, first of all, of my parents and a lot of the parents that lived in that neighborhood, many of them were first generation up from the South. And the people were brought up here. The people were the great migration north was because once you didn't want to do sharecropping and that sort of stuff, and I'm not going to go through the whole, the whole story, but the industrialization of the north with the steel mills and the car manufacturing, all that stuff is what attracted people up this way. And they got other jobs as postmen and teachers and stuff like that. But all of those, I grew up in a community, we were poor, but we didn't know it. We didn't know it because we had lots of love and we had the ability for the neighbors and everybody to work together. We had our stores right on the corner that were owned by people in the community. Most all the businesses were owned by people that lived in the community. Now that industrial base is gone. And so those communities that were once thriving and even on the south and west side, what happened was, and what people don't talk about, is that the bases that made those thriving communities, the industry that provided the kind of jobs people needed, are gone. When they changed the policy federally and made steel cheaper to make outside the United States than inside the United States and shut down, at least partly shut down, a lot of the steel manufacturing here in the United States, those people lost those good jobs. Yeah. So that, these things didn't get created by themselves. This was intentional. And when they made those decisions, leaving these communities deserted, and that's another desertion because to have a food desert, that's the noun. But there's a verb called desert. And that's what what's happened. These became deserted communities. I just couldn't agree with you more, Terry, on the issue of public policy. Um, we've had public policies in this country that have contributed to, to these problems for, for since the inception of our, our country. And, you know, the one thing that really bugs me, uh, and I'll just say this and then let you react, and I, I think we're almost done here, is it seems like every election cycle, um, politicians will stand up and they'll talk about these issues, these challenges, uh, these communities, these forgotten communities, and maybe they'll offer up a plan. <clears throat> and, and some of them don't even bother to do that, as, as you know. <laughs> but the, the paradigm that, that it seems like we always live through every election is the politician from afar who's going to come in and fix, the, fix everything. And I think that that's one reason why these communities continue to be forgotten year after year and nothing, nothing happens. Um, we've, we've really turned a blind eye to this because it's really all about rhetoric. And I think that, that as a society, what we need to do is we need to figure out a new paradigm where we figure out how to organize folks in these communities, how to inform and inspire them, um, how to resource them, and how to share information on programs, community projects that work, like your program, for example. You know, your program needs to be bottled up, what you're doing at that farm, and it needs to be put into a form that other people can access, other people can learn about. And of course, that's what we're trying to do through, as you know, through our platform, Open Tribe, is we're trying to to, uh, to do that, we're trying to, to inform and inspire, organize, and provide people ideas, ideas for projects that could work in their own communities. And I think this is what we need to do because there's talent, there's passion, there's leadership in these communities. Well, I think that's true. I think that's true. But what we have to do in our policies is design them so that people get a hand up, not a hand out. Uh, we need to make certain that the policies are funded at the level 
where we can create self-sustaining enterprises. Uh, the, the, the welfare system uh, was a, a horrific, how maybe well-intentioned it might have been, but it was a horrific thing that happened. Uh, yes, there are people who are disenfranchised and there are people that are poor and things of that nature, but why, we need to look at why they're poor in the first place. What happened? They weren't always poor. And so the question is, we do need to make certain that we have affordable housing. I mean, there are some things that we do need. We do need to make certain that our schools are well-funded. We do need to make certain that our, our streets and our neighborhoods are, are free of these toxic dumps and places that create uh, bad issues for the air and, and water and radon and all that sort of stuff. Yes, we need to do that. But we need to make certain that we create those structures that allow people to have a sense of value, a sense of worth, and not have to rely on, not to, not to have to rely on, it's one thing to supplement, but it's another thing when that becomes the major thing that you do. And so what we have to, what we have to think about is as we engineer, for example, I was talk, talking to somebody the other day about, I think it was in Mississippi, where they opened a new car automobile, I mean automobile plant, and created these jobs where people were making fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year, and how it got so much of the crime went away, so much of the things went away when people could make a living wage to take care of their families. Yeah, I, I agree, Terry. And and by the way, just to clarify my earlier comment. Um, I do uh, obviously feel that uh, there's a place for the right policies um, because as you pointed out we've had the wrong policies in place for a long time so you know there is a place for policy um, I think what I'm getting at is I think we need to put more thought uh, as we're thinking about that policy about how to localize it in a way that um, empowers people in these in these communities to do great things and uh, just because these communities are again are full of ideas and talents and passion and energy and 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 we need to we need to figure that out um before well we the one thing i would yeah. say real quickly if i can say something real quickly mm -hmm. what we have to the other thing we have to do is it's a it's a total thing it's it's not just the policies mm -hmm. it's what things are produced for television for radio for entertainment because when I look at and when I think about when we talk about all the violence and I don't know if you've ever looked at some of these these video games, the music that the music industry helps to pump out, because I know a lot of very talented young people who are trying to make reasonably good music, but they don't get record contracts. They don't get deals and they don't get deals because it's not profane enough. It doesn't defile women enough. It doesn't glamorize a gangster lifestyle enough. It doesn't do those things. So what do what, what models, what are we showing our youth? And now with the advent, and I'm not denigrating the advent of the things like uh, the, all the social media and what have you, but what I'm really dismayed about is the values that we're seeing portrayed by the activities that are sometimes placed on these social media platforms not just by blacks, but by a lot of people. And we've got to think about what is that doing to yet unformed minds, uncompletely formed minds about what's important and what life is about and how do we begin to think about living together as humans on this planet in you know, a harmonious way, not just with ourselves, but with the planet too. Yeah, you know, Terry, I, uh, I, I know why we're such good friends because uh, you just said something, you just hit a hot button for me. I, I look at that as another kind of nutrition, you know, what we're feeding our minds. Mm -hmm. And, it, it, you know, a lot of times when, when people complain about the violence and the, the, the degradation of women and so forth, you know, they're made to feel like sticks in the mud. But, you know, like maybe somehow they're, they're too socially conservative or whatever. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a matter of compassion. You know, we, we do need to be thinking about you know, what we're exposing our young people to. 
because it is formative. Terry, just to end this, this discussion, I wanted to ask you this question. Um, I'm just curious how you're, you know, what you're thinking and feeling about this since uh, the murder of George Floyd and all of the protests around the country. Um, do, do you have any uh, kind of from the heart thoughts or feelings that you want to share? Well, you know, Nelson, the kinds of things that happened to George Floyd have been happening for a long time. The difference this time was the world saw it happen in real time on video as it happened. So the many, many times that people have talked about torture of black men or this disproportionate use of force in black men, which were nice, maybe some stories that people saw, heard about, uh, but no one had ever seen it all over the world as it happened. That was what was different because it was undisputable about what happened. There was no way of getting around it. There was no way to nuance it in a press conference or to try and make it seem as though the victim was actually partly responsible for it. And so people of good of goodwill, people who are of, of, of empathy, when they saw that, when they saw that, they're like, damn, this is really happening. This really, this, is this what we've come to? Knowing that we've been this way for a long time. But for the first time, you saw it. A lot of people saw it. And they are good people who became incensed by what they saw. Some who had been seeing it and couldn't say, I told you so, but who were like, I, this was a tipping point. So the death of George Floyd, or the, mur the, murder, the death by murder of George Floyd, really helped to ignite a a spark, a flame of the resurrection of the humanity of people, all kinds of people that said, this is wrong. This is wrong and should not happen, even though it had been happening a long time. But they saw it themselves as it happened. And because cell phones now are ubiquitous and because of what you can, what you can do with media, from a positive point of view, made it such that people could see this all around the world. And it changed the world and will hopefully change it forever. And hopefully we'll end up changing some of the policies and the attitudes that created this. I couldn't agree more, Terry. I agree with, uh, with every word that you said. And I think what it shows is that, you know, despite, uh, a lot of the, the issues we have in our modern society, including the one we just talked about with respect to violence in the media, that there's still a, a vast reservoir of compassion. Um, I think our default nature is to love one another, and, um, and I think we've seen a lot of that here recently. So, and, I, and I do agree. I think that this is a change that's going to stick this time. So, um, well, uh, any, any, anything else you want to say? here, Terry, before we sign off? Yeah, I just want to say thank you, Nelson, for all the work that you've been doing, you, your dad, your family. I want to ask God to continue to bless all of you with continued health and strength. I, I, and, and the people that work with you, I think your emphasis on Plant Pure Nation, the desire to make sure that everybody has the kind of food that we want uh, that, and that we need, but also that we have to change to because if we don't, we're gonna destroy the planet and we won't be able to have this food anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that that's why what you're doing is so very, very important. And I'm honored to, that you would think enough to, to ask me to have a few words on, on your show. And I'd be honored again to whenever you want to, to mm -hmm. have more because this is how we have to do this one heart at a time, one mind at a time, and, and then let, use, let us use this media medium 
to, to multiply that exponentially for the rest of our lives. Yeah, and Terry, <laughs> the honor goes the other way. I'm, I'm so honored that you're here. And um, I knew when I first got to know you that I had met, uh, met a kindred spirit. Um, there, there's a lot about us that's very similar. And um, we will come back to talk to you and to follow your story there in Chicago because I think that you have a lot to teach to a lot of people around the country. And uh, so we'll be having you back on the show again for sure. But uh, thanks for being here today, Terry. Really appreciate it. You're a good friend. And uh, I'll catch up with you later. All right. Thank you, Nelson. Be blessed. Thanks, my friend. So today we've established another story thread, this one in Chicago, and so relevant to all that's recently happened in our country. This story connects to the project on Open Tribe focused on bringing the plant-based nutrition message into underserved communities. Indeed, all the stories we'll follow on our show will be related to Open Tribe projects. So we hope you can visit opentribe.com if you haven't already done so. I've said it many times, and I'll say it at the end of every show until I decide to say something else. Our world may sometimes seem upside down facing a hopeless future, but appearances can be deceiving. I believe we have an opportunity today to make transformative change that prior generations couldn't have even imagined. So don't forget to smile when you get the chance. And thank you for joining us.